Welcome back, everyone. Um, I've seen this seen this movie before, but every time I have the same experience, um, I was always touched by it. Um, anyway, I'm Rani, and this is Suraj, and we will be moderating this um, discussion. The views expressed during this community discussion are of the speaker only and not necessarily the views of our organization, Periscope Foundation, or the Medicating Normal team, but we welcome dialogue from all points of view. Lastly, this panel discussion is for general educational purposes only. This discussion does not constitute professional medical advice, encouragement, or recommendation that any individual reduce or withdraw from the psychiatric medication. So I'm now going to invite the panelists and let each of them share a little bit about themselves and their reaction to the film uh, on, and what has happened since the film uh, was completed. So first of all, we are really grateful that Lynn Cunningham has been able to join us today. So Lynn is the co-director, hi Lynn, and co-producer of um, Medicating Normal. So if Lynn, you'd like to go first and tell us the kind of story behind Medicating Normal. Thank you, Dr. Rami and Suraj for hosting Medicating Normal. Um, we're really excited about this, the Mental Health Mastery, Mental Wealth Mastery Summit. Um, it's a great title that you guys came up with. Um, the film, um, I think I want to dedicate the film to uh, the notion of lived experience. Um, not that I have gone through it myself personally, but I have a beloved family member um, who went through many of these issues in um, right after college. And um, it was at a time in the US when um, nobody was questioning um, medication at all across the board. And um, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, the internet really, because I think what the internet did was allow people who were going through this to talk with each other, share experiences with each other. And um, if it weren't for the internet and the, the groups of people and the support groups that we um, were able to um, tap into, this film would never have been made. So um, I'm just very grateful for that. And and in my personal experience, it was, it was um, it's been a very long road that our family has followed. And um, we watched a very, very talented and adjusted um, individual um, become dysfunctional. Um, she was diagnosed with a, a serious mental illness in her uh, mid twenties. Um, but right before that, she had been an athlete, a scholar, a, a very high functioning member of society. And um, she, we were told that she had a lifelong chemical imbalance. And um, it wasn't until years later when she kept, would say to me, call me on a daily basis, she would say, Linny, is everything going to be all right? And I always interpreted that. And here's an example of someone not really listening as a family member. I interpreted that as, um, you know, am I going to be okay financially? And we would always reassure her, yes, yes, we love you. Your siblings love you. We're going to be there for you. You're never going to have to worry. But it, it didn't dawn on me that that wasn't really what she was saying. What she was saying is, um, am I going to regain my purpose, my ability to contribute to this world in a functioning way. And that somewhere along, you know, six to 10 years ago dawned on me and I realized how disingenuous I had been um, not really listening to her. And I started to read and research and uh, read Bob Whitaker's book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, met Laura Delano, one of our panelists. I just, I just started to learn about an entire world that I knew nothing about and that our family had known nothing about when we began this, this journey. Um, so um, again, I just want to talk about how important that has been, that learning. And our film is about uh, listening really on the very broadest issue. And we did not make the film 
to push an agenda. Um, we believe that this issue is filled with so many different perspectives, so many different perspectives, um, that um, it, it's not one side or another, it's everybody listening to each other. So that is why I think what you guys are doing here at this summit is so very important. And um, the film itself, um, everyone now here in your audience is part of the film um, because we're part of the dialogue. And um, it, it will be aired on public television in the US uh, in January. And uh, shortly thereafter, we will have it available on our website and all, all the other uh, streaming sites I'm hoping too. Um, we're working that out right now. And um, stay posted on our um, website, medicatingnormal.com for details about all of that. But anyway, I thank you guys so much for carrying on this dialogue because that's what we all have to do. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I, I just had a follow up question, really. I know it's the film's been so um, warmly received all uh, across the world. And you've had so many screenings and what has it been like for you to get that uh, that much sort of love and acceptance and how the message is uh, seems to be resonating with so many around the world yeah um it, it is true um we have an amazing outreach team angie is on our our outreach team and nicole and um i think we're we've had more than 175 community screenings many of which are virtual um but uh, a lot of the, the, what we love about these community screenings all around the world is that we do make room for panel discussions, which is where we, which is a little bit what I'm nervous about the broadcast, the PBS broadcast, because it won't have what we're doing right now. And these panel discussions are, they're non-judgmental. People are, can, can talk about their experience and it's as legitimate as anybody's. And I think maybe that's why it's so well received because it just comes from a place of, hey, let's solve this together and talk about it openly. Um, um, and the same is true. We were in, we've been in 16 film festivals, winning seven awards, best documentary in their impact award. And um, I think it because it hits a chord because this, there is so much medication out there and there's so much struggle and despair out there that I just think it's a common, it's just a common universal human thing that we're all facing. Doesn't matter what country in, everyone has it. So, but thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Lynn. And thank you for coming and being part of this today. And that, that means a lot. So uh, we'll try and uh, move on to um, the rest of the panel discussion now. Um, so we've got about, how much time have we got? Half an hour, close to half an hour plus a little bit. So we'll try to finish um by about 7 15 and at the very latest so if i can um come to dr San sandra sandy steingard really um if you don't mind so you are a clinical associate professor of psychiatry so if you'd like to sort of introduce yourself um, and give us a bit about your background and what you are currently involved in uh, sandy that'd be great and also your views about sure. this movie, having watched this movie with us. Okay, um, so as you mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm, I'm actually a retired psychiatrist now. Um, I worked for many years in a community mental health center in Burlington, Vermont. And my interest uh, has been in treating people who um, psychiatrists would classify as being psychotic, sort of altered realities, hearing things that other people don't hear. And that was my um, driving passion in psychiatry for many, many years. And for most of that time, I did think that the uh, sort of medical conceptualization of psychosis made some sense, more so than it did with a lot of other disorders in psychiatry. Um, but in the 90s, because I'm, I'm an old psychiatrist, um, so I've been involved with the field um, well, since the 70s, really. And, um, and I saw a shift really in the 90s. Uh, I'd say the introduction of Prozac, which is mentioned in the movie, was kind of the, the big thing. And Bob Whitaker talks about um, already like flaws beforehand. But, you know, if you were around at the time, it was like this 
you know, the second coming. I mean, the, the promotion to it. And what I saw in the 90s um, was, it was obvious to me that was what was being promoted, including promoted by the leaders of my field, you know, academic psychiatrists, did not comport with what the um, literature actually said. And it also didn't comport with what I was seeing. So for instance, I was very struck by the fact that this one drug, olanzapine, which was marketed under the name Zyprexa, it was very obvious to me within a year that it caused very, very significant weight gain. And yet that was kind of, um, you know, argued over within academic psychiatry for a long time. So that started to uh, raise questions. And then it led to a lot of reading in that area about commercial influences. And then eventually I also found anatomy of an epidemic and that raised other questions, this whole issue of long-term care. So the last sector of my um, career was delving into that and kind of rethinking everything that I had thought um, about psychiatry and the way to use the drugs. And I also had the privilege to meet quite a few of the people on the panel here who had a huge influence on, on my life and um, you know my way of thinking about this. So I, I may have gone on too long and I apologize, but you know the film, um, I've now had the privilege of watching it a few times and talking with Angie and I've been on other panels. I mean, every time I have to say, um, it's very moving and upsetting. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, I'm relieved to no longer have access to a prescription pad. I, I really had a hard time reconciling the whole thing. And, um, you know, it's not to say, I mean, I appreciate the tone of respecting everybody's views, but um, for me, you know, there's so much of a societal message um, that, um, you know, that supports this particular narrative, it was, it was hard. And it was, um, I feel like I'm in recovery. Uh, I, I mean, I have a lot of privilege, so I don't want to like equate the pain and struggle I've had with the, the other kinds of pain and struggling, but it has, I mean, I, I'm really, I feel like I'm still um, coming to terms with the whole thing. So I'll stop there. Thank you again for inviting me. It's always a real honor, uh, you know, small time doctor. <laughs> <laughs> being involved in this international movement. It's funny. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Sandy. I really appreciate that. So if I can quickly um, introduce everyone else as well. Um, coming to you, Laura. Um, Laura Delano, you are the executive director of Inner Compass Initiative and also co-founder of the Withdrawal Project. Uh, it'd be really good to hear um, a little bit about that, about your work. Uh, and I would like to kind of um, present uh, some of the questions that have popped up on the Q&A as well. Um, so if you'd like to sort of tell us a bit about um, what you do and your background, Laura, then we can proceed. Sure, yeah. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm really honored. And just quickly to respond to Sandy, it's so nice to see you. Um, I I think you you should never feel like you have to, you know, minimize the profound struggle of what this must be like as a psychiatrist waking up to all of this. I think I can't imagine what it must feel like to realize that this work you've, you not specifically, but just generally, you know, poured your life and your heart into to help people might actually be hurting people. And so I, I think you and any other practitioner who's, who's, not just changing how they practice in their own um, personal lives, but who has, has, you know, who speaks out about it too, is incredibly courageous. And that, yeah, that's a, it's a big deal. I just wanted to say that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, my name is Laura Delano. I'm in Connecticut in the US. Um, I come to this work as an ex-patient. I was put on psychiatric drugs when I was a kid, I was 14. After getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, for what I now see was very, you know, um, healthy, meaningful struggle that I began to face when I hit puberty. Um, and yeah, I, I spent 14 years in the system on many different meds, acquiring many different diagnoses along the way, 
And, you know, I'm a story out of Robert Whitaker's book and that, you know, the, the longer I took these drugs, the more my life fell apart. And as Angie said so poignantly in the film, not once did anyone, including myself, <laughs> stop and step back and say like, wait a minute, what if the meds are playing a part here? Not once until the very end. Um, and so when I came off of all the drugs in 2010, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea about slow tapering. I didn't understand the profundity of physical drug dependence. Um, I came off five drugs very quickly over a matter of like half a year, which is incredibly fast. Um, and went through a brutal experience, um, that really took you know, year, it took a few years for me to feel like I was like reintegrated and, and kind of like alive. <laughs> um, and I'm more than 10 years off now. And it's just amazing how life has unfolded. And to anyone out there right now, who's in it and the thick of it, it might feel impossible to imagine that, that this could be your future. Um, but just hang on to hope because we heal it for some of us, it takes longer than others, but we heal and, um, intercompass initiative, came into being when I realized, you know, how hard it is, all the information out there, the information that the film so powerfully shares, it's all out there. We can all access it, but, um, but if, unless you dive in and spend months, if not years, like becoming your own self-taught expert on pharmacology and drug research and institutional corruption and all of that, it's, it's hard to, to learn this stuff. And so I realized, you know, as people taking these drugs, um, we have a right to make meaningfully informed choices because there is no such thing as choice if it's not informed. And so um, with a few colleagues, we created this nonprofit based in the US and our mission is to help people make more informed choices about taking psychiatric drugs, coming off them, about the diagnoses and the diagnostic paradigm, about drug research, about the whole thing. And then we also help people find each other in person online through our networking platforms um, because mutual aid for many of us has been literally life saving. So I'll wrap it up there and just, I'm really appreciative to be here and I'm eager to, to hear from everyone else and engage with the community listening. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Laura. Let's hear from our other panelists as well. Um, so Brian. So you work as a GP in the NHS, of course, uh, that's where Rani and I work as well. And you've always had a special interest in psychiatry and the spectrum of human psychological emotional experiences. So tell us a bit about uh, what you do currently um, and, and, and what you thought about the film in brief. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Suraj. Um, so, um, yeah, so I work as a GP within the NHS at the moment, and I, I've got an interest in mental health, so I do a little bit of one-to-one -one work as well with people. Um, I, I wasn't that interested in psychiatry up until about a year or two after I finished med school, um, and I attended a, a kind of conference which has a lot of these type of voices. Um, so people with lived experiences and it completely changed my perspective. As, as Lynn said, it was like stepping into a whole new world um, with a whole lot of different perspectives. So I had learned about chemical imbalance theories and then I had to unlearn that and learn that actually th there is no such evidence, there's no evidence to indicate such a thing. And, and similar to the effect that the film has on me and that it's kind of, it's upsetting and distressing in ways. So was learning about how, um, the, the kind of the way in which medical school and, and GP training to, to, some, to some degree as well um, conditions you to look through a diagnostic lens. And I think you can see that in the film that people were presenting in uh, very understandable distress, such as warfare scenarios or um, chronic insomnia um, or distress of going to a, a prestigious, prestigious university like MIT. Uh, and, and that was just simply put in a diagnostic box. And once that diagnostic box is there, then that inevitably leads to, to um, a medication-based approach. So uh, I'm kind of talking about myself and the film at the same time at the moment. Um, but I think the film really impactfully conveys the, the impact and uh, the, the way in which 
how doctors are trained influences their actions. And in a lot of the scenarios, you saw that when people went back with questions of, well, is there any alternative? They weren't given any kind of reasonable answer and they were just directed to a different type of medication or up, up titrating the dosage. Um, I think the film also um, conveys incredibly well the potentially negative effects of medication for some people um, and also withdrawal effects, which basically I learned very little or nothing about in medical school and GP training. Um, in fact, I gave presentations to my colleagues, but I didn't learn anything about it at the time from, from anyone else, and it wasn't part of the curriculum. Um, and this is a really, really huge topic because uh, if the film conveys one in five Americans. I think there's one in seven uh, people in the UK on psychotropic medication. So it's a really, really hu huge topic. Um, and in my view, ideally, in an ideal world, this film would be shown to every medical student, you know, every GP trainee, every, every psychiatry trainee. Um, and the film also uh, portrays really well why this happens. So it, it portrays the influence of drug companies on um, the studies in which are, the studies that are performed um, and how that how the messages from those studies can be very distorted. So we saw that with the benzodiazepine study. Um, and also how it influences our culture. So how we think about ourselves and our own distress, um, like the, the kind of marketing to the American public. And you saw a lot of the, the adverts. And even though that isn't present in the UK and Ireland, um, the, uh, as an Irish GP, I was subject to a lot of advertising in GP magazines with messages such as um, Lexapro, treat the core of depression, um, which is a very, um, which is an explicit kind of message really that, you know, these medications are, are treating or healing some sort of chemical imbalance. And that further kind of reinstills that message that was conveyed in medical educational training. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so personally, I found both the film, like, I guess, um, quite saddening and it makes it parts of it made me angry or very disappointed and almost ashamed to be a doctor in ways. Uh, and at other times, I also think it's, it's really fantastic because there is this there is more knowledge and there is more awareness around these issues. Um, and Laura is part of Inner Compass and there's other um, amazing other projects um, that are typically grassroots projects that are, that are helping people have a broader understanding. And, and I think it's amazing that in these forums, we have people with lived experiences as well as professionals who are kind of much more, have a broader perspectives of, about how distress happens, generally speaking, in all its forms, why it happens and, and what measures we can do to address that. Um, so, um, and I'm just going to address one of the questions that I saw pop up. So one of the questions was, um, are withdrawal effects lifelong? And um, my understanding is that that really depends on the person, um, the amount of time they're on a particular medication, um, um, the amount of medication they're on. So the higher the dose, the greater the risk of withdrawal effects. And obviously whether they taper and if they taper, how slowly they taper. And, and Dave, uh, the character Dave's um, uh, graph at the end showed a kind of an exponential gradual reduction, which is what evidence is showing now is best that you can withdraw a slightly quicker, but still very slowly at the beginning and then when it comes to the lower doses, you actually have to do so often very extremely slowly. Um, but in the film, as it conveys, you know, a lot of people don't get that much support with the withdrawal process. And you saw people shaving pills and it's very much a do-it-yourself do job, often with the support of online communities. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you so much um, for hosting this and thank you for um, the producers of the film as well. It's, it's really an amazing project. Thank you, Brian. That's lovely. Uh, Angie, if, if you can sort of quickly give us um, your sort of uh, story with the movie and what a powerful sort of uh, portrayal of what you went through in the movie uh, and, and where you are right now and, and the work that you do in, in sharing and informing and educating all of us around the world. Well, thank you. 
Yeah, so I, I am now six years off of all medications. And the film, like the scene from the couch was 2016, just to give you an idea that that was like a, it's been a five-year process um, since they came to me first in my living room. And um, I would say I'm still suffering definitely from some neurological effects from all the years of medication. Um, I just recently went to a uh, neuro-ophthalmologist because I have like kind of like these semi-permanent permanent I don't know uh, visual changes and distortions and I was I was just really shocked I guess because it's been a long time since I sought out like therapy or psychiatry or anything and so one of the recommended treatments for my eye condition is therapy and CBT and so they put in a referral for the CBT and then the doctor called me and then they found out oh she was also trained as a therapist. So maybe she needs somebody a little bit more advanced. And so then I told them like, look, I'm a very difficult patient. I'm not really sure I want to do this. And then, <laughs> the, but the most shocking part I'll tell you was when the next doctor called the psychologist, he said, or she said, um, we looked back in your file and we see a lot of trauma there. And we think we should work on that first. And I'll just tell you, I just felt so violated by that. Like, that is not what I'm asking for. I don't want you digging through my you know, judging me now based on something that happened 20 years ago and that you've determined through your own reading that I need more therapy. That's not, it's not okay with me. And so my relationship, I guess, to the system, you can hear the anger in my voice. Like it just feels so just, just wrong. You know what I mean? On so many levels. So it's like the trauma continues, you know what I'm saying? Even if you try to get away, you know, I try not to keep that anger inside. And part of my involvement with the film is really, it's been extremely validating because I hear from patients and doctors, you know, doctors that say, I didn't know about this. I didn't learn this in school. This film is absolutely right. I want to help. Tell me how I have psychiatrists that text me on a regular basis, asking me about their cases. You know, how do I help this person? I never thought that would happen. Um, so it's been validating this journey and, um, re-traumatizing at times. And, you know, I've had to protect my own energy at other times because people reach out all the time because there's so much suffering around this issue. And I can just feel, um, just even reading the comments and just seeing, remembering what it's like to like be laying in bed and trying not to die because you just feel so horrible. So kind of like Laura said, you know, just hang on. It's going to end. I'm so much better now. I live in a van. It's a little camper van. It's really cute. And I travel the country. And right now I'm driving from uh, Oklahoma to California. And I just like the freedom. And I like to think. And I like to be and be around strangers that know, don't know anything about me or what's happened. And just be in the world and figure out who I am again. So that's where I am now. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Angie. Um, we've got quite a few questions, so if we uh, jump to the Q&A, so I'm going to uh, read out the questions and then yeah, see who would like to go first and attempt to answer. So here's a question about um, support. So what kind of support is needed and available when trying to get off medication? I started the process and don't have a support system or family where I live in Portugal. Any takers? I, I could speak to that if no one else wanted to. Oh, yeah, yeah, go on. Um, it's a really important question. And I think it's a, you know, it's, of course, there's no one answer to that. I think, you know, I know people who wanted no support. They didn't even want anyone to know they were doing this. And they just kind of hid themselves away and went through their thing. Um, and then, of course, people at the other end of the spectrum end up needing and wanting big expansive support networks. Um, what I can say from my own experience is that having, I think first and foremost, um, connections to other people who've been through it is, is, yeah, for me, it was essential. And because you can have the support of, of family, friends, practitioners, um, and but if they haven't been through it themselves, even when the people around you have the best of intentions, like sometimes they're just, it feels, there feels to, it's like there's a divide still. So I think having people in your life who've been through what you're in and who can say to you, it gets better, who can share what their journey has been like, who can hear all the, the darkness and the madness and the stuff that many other people might be too afraid to hear and sit with you and be with you in it. Um, I think that, I think that's huge. And, and of course, then the question is, well, how do I find that? And 
you know, we're in the dark ages, really, even though the withdrawal movement has been growing for well over a decade at this point, we're still in the dark ages and it isn't always easy to find support, especially in person. Um, if I could just give a plug for uh, at Intercompass Initiative and the Withdrawal Project, we have um, free networking platforms. If you go to either website and you click connect on the main menu, um, you can join our communities and they allow you to find people in your area. You can search by geographical radius. You can filter by the specific needs you have. Um, you can find people who've been off for a while, people who've been on the meds you're on. Um, and it's just a way to, to connect directly uh, with, with people one-on-one -on -one privately who've been through it. And we also have um, on Facebook uh, a private community called Inner Compass Conversations, where we have and Angie's one of the, uh, the leaders of our group, and we have regular live stream conversations about withdrawal and surviving it and, and what it's like to become an ex-patient, and there's just a rich community there. So um, to anyone who's seeking that kind of community, please, you're welcome to, to join us. We would love to have you as a part of it. That's brilliant. Got another question here. Um, somebody says, I am a community mental health worker. When I see someone struggling with their mental health, on top of helping them, helping with some difficulties they may face, I also encourage them to see their doctor. Now, seeing the negative long term uh, side effects, including withdrawal symptoms, which is huge, what is the best way to get the right balance to help someone get access to the right mental health support? I think that's what they wanted to ask. I'll say something really quick. I just wish instead of being given to a professional mm. that um, those friends were, you know, helping me then and there. Like, I think Mary Beaton in the film, the, the Navy psychologist, she says something like, you are that person. Don't send them somewhere else. You know, you are that person. So I think that is very important, but also like showing the person back to themselves. Like if somebody would have said, you know, your body is incredibly amazing and able to heal you have the inner resources needed, you have the strength needed, it's going to be a hard journey, there's lots of things to try, let me help you find some resources like acupuncture, or equine therapy, or service dog, or meditation, whatever, there's so many things out there, most are very, are very low cost or free, that would have saved me like 20 years, being in the system, taking a medication every day, reinforcing that there was something wrong with me, so now I have to like undo all of that, you know, and it continues, the consequences continue of that, looking for that easy fit easy fix. So I would say help the first person find their way back to themselves and give them the resources that really enable true healing, not just passing them off to someone else. I, mean, I, would, I think that I was going to add something. I mean, if you're in the system, I think it can be a tricky thing. And um, if you're perceived as challenging the kind of prevailing narrative or the medical system, but I think, and I think this lies with what Angie's saying is I, I do think it's an obligation of anyone in the system to become educated and to not reflexively um, sort of parrot back some narrative, which turns out to be a pretty empty narrative, you know, the so-called chemical imbalance thing. And, and then when you're working with someone, and I think Laura's written very eloquently, I, think you, I remember reading something you wrote about how I would have talked to myself, you know, 10 years ago, because people can feel very judged. So just bringing it up or wondering, you know, not assuming, you know, people want to come off, but just, you know, I'm wondering whether you have any curiosity about this. So, you know, to just not be so reflexive, because, you know, I used to get calls from, you know, the other people where I worked, most people weren't doctors, the great majority weren't but someone wasn't doing well. And the reflective thing was, you know, check their meds, you know, <laughs> this is, and it took a lot of work where I was to start to say, let's just not assume that everything we're seeing requires more meds. In fact, it could be from the meds. So th those are my comments on that. Um, I, I could speak to that question. I, I would say that I guess um, psychiatrists and GPs aren't like a um, a uniform species, so we're we're very very different. Um, and some 
GPs have an interest and have uh, quite a lot of empathy and will be open to different perspectives, would have read some things. And other GPs have a special interest in surgery and want to literally will, will, will have a very kind of blunt way of dealing with you. So if you can seek out a GP or a psychiatrist who meets your needs if possible, um, that, that obviously may be, may be difficult uh, based on geographical reason, uh, for geographical reasons, but also do your own research if, if possible um, and, and educate yourself before you visit your doctor. Um, and if you have a plan in place, most GPs are psychiatrists. If you do want to withdraw and you want to do so safely, most of them will try and support you if you if they if you feel confident and if you have done your own research and also if you have a support network if you're um you know if a family member or a friend is supporting you in that journey and, and, can, and can help support you and they feel confident that you have that network then you you may you may be have have a better chance i guess of success um but it, it really is dependent like i guess some of the stories in the film like of Angie's story of just being on a cocktail of medication and increased and, and then they stop completely and then add in another, like in my, GP, in my training in psychiatry, that would often happen. And it was extremely disheartening and there was little or no acknowledgement of withdrawal effects a lot of the time. Um, so it, it, it's very varied. And I think, um, yeah, it depends on the doctor who you're seeing, but some of them will be responsive and, re and will be receptive if, for example, you show them some material from the Inner Compass Initiative. Um, or, uh, there's another website called the Council of Evidence-Based Psychiatry, which also has a lot of uh, really good information. Well, um, thank you both. I thought that the excellent uh, answers. Um, I want to follow, follow, follow up with another question though. Sometimes people, come to us for help and they are not interested in other options. They say, I have already tried those and they have heard about medication. So they want medication. And right at the beginning, we talked about not being anti-meds, but in, you know, uh, but informed consent. So I just wonder if someone came and asked for medication um, or this is what they are looking for, how would you approach it uh, in terms of what do professionals need to do in order to take informed consent and what could a well um, informed consumer uh, do to give informed consent so i wonder who would like to answer this right i can I mean, try but sorry oh, go ahead brian and um, so I, I think this is it's, it's also so in the UK, at least most GPs prescribe most antidepressants, for example, antipsychotics and benzodiazepines are often prescribed by psychiatrists. But I would say try to be slow in everything you do. Try to be well informed and try to be slow. Don't rush to start medications and don't rush to stop them. Um, and um because of the lack of like um, good resources out there, I, I've, I personally made my own consent forms and my own kind of brain documents, which go through the potential benefits, risks, alternatives, what happens if I do nothing, um, uh, documents and, that I get people to read before they make that decision. And I think you really want to read that, but actually you want to talk it through with someone or a few people before you make that decision. Um, so to me, it involves reading if possible, but also a, a discussion with at least one other person, uh, be it that your doctor or otherwise, because you do want to get people's viewpoints on the potential pros and cons of starting or stopping a medication. Very good points, Brian. Thank you. I know, Laura, you probably need to shoot off very soon. Um, I'm good to go until about eight past. I just have something that starts at 15. Past. Oh, brilliant. Good to have you for that time. Um, I was going to pick uh, up. On a, do you have any other questions? No. No? Shall we go back to the chat box and see what's coming up? There's some really long, long questions. So I'm trying to see if I can uh, get to the summary of, of that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is um, a good one. Um, somebody asks, I think the saddest thing of all is that now so much is out there about this problem. It's in the journals like the BMJ and yet still there is a huge denial about this. And so often you just get told you have to stay on meds or before you come off, that's, um, that's why you are ill. 
and I was told you have been off too long. Um, and this person was off for about a year at that point. Um, and they were told it can't possibly be withdrawal and that my NHS family GP, what can we do about this and educate somehow? And this is quite a common story in our experience as well uh, in, from our work in the UK. Um, Sandy, do you want to pick this one? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was, <laughs> I had more thoughts on the other thing about informed consent, which is just to say, as a doctor, you don't have to prescribe a drug. And it is a complicated conversation. You want to approach someone with empathy, but because, you know, if someone came in and said, you know, I want you to do this surgery that I didn't think was indicated, I wouldn't need to do it. So, I mean, a lot of, it does take a lot of conversation. And if you do prescribe it to just be to give true full informed consent which i think is the problem but in terms of how to change things i mean i have to say i i'm not you know i think it, what other people here are doing movies like this and the work that laura's doing and um i know you're having joanna moncrief as one of your panelists who's you know someone who's been very influential in my life and her colleague mark harwitz i think is doing tremendous work because he um He's he had he speaks, you know, from a number of different perspectives and he has a certain uh, authority, uh, knowledge authority that I think is invaluable. I mean, I look at the UK and think you're way ahead of the US because in most circles in the US, it's just not even on the table. It's just it's very frustrating. And we have people like Adele Minor, well, Laura, who've been at this for a long time. So I I just think this pull to find a drug is um is so powerful um someone in the chat room mentioned the, this thing that's a, a tv show dope sick that's about the um opiate and opioid epidemic and saying i think this happened in all of medicine it happened in all of medicine i mean i'm glad that's getting attention because so many people have died but honestly it's really just a subtype of a problem that happens throughout it so i don't know i i i don't have any great um answer um other than what other people here are already doing can i say something about informed consent from a patient perspective just that i i think i read those i read a lot of the pamphlets that i was given and i don't think it really it really can sink in because you just don't have the frame of reference to know how deep the suffering will be so for instance when you read dizziness you think okay i might be a little lightheaded get out of bed slowly it'll be fine no the dizziness that I experienced coming off, I could not shower standing up for two years. Okay, that is the amount of dizziness. So how do you give fully informed consent if the person doesn't even have the frame of reference for the amount of suffering they can experience? There just is none. So there's also akathisia. We don't know, and, and there's so many other things. Akathisia is a movement disorder. It makes you feel like you're being tortured alive. I experienced it for about two years. Um, you just cannot, you don't, you can't even imagine what it's gonna be like. There's just no way. So. The other problem is, like I hear a lot that people say, you know, my medication saved my life, they work for me, I can't, don't even, don't you dare talk about it or take, you know, don't take them away from me, how dare you. I was that person six years ago. Before before I came off that last drug, I never even wanted to get off, get off of medications. That was not a plan, that was not a goal. I was the person telling you, these meds are saving my life, I will kill myself without them. And then they stopped working whatever that means. Okay. So a lot of times I think we feel safe in that, you know, I'm not addicted to them or they work for me, but your body is always changing. You might want to get pregnant and breastfeed. And then how does that, you know, what happens then you, you will age, you might get, you know, a chronic disease, who knows, you might gain so much weight that you get diabetes and then you have to rethink your treatment. So I just, I think informed consent is an ever evolving process. None of us can predict what's going to happen in the future. If you are that subsection of people that can stay on them long term and be relatively okay you're in the minority i would say not the majority if i could add one um yeah another layer to what sandy and angie shared um i think what complicates not just making informed choices but also um to the earlier question about like what do you do when everyone around you is telling you this can't possibly be withdrawal, you need your meds, all that. What, you know, what makes 
this so complicated is that the diagnoses we have by their very nature are meant to make us question ourselves, our minds, our, our capacity to think, to feel, to know what, you know, what's right. Um, and, you know, the longer, for, speaking for myself, the longer I, I, you know, sunk into this identity as, as a mental patient really is how I think about it. Um, the, the more I lost touch with the capacity to, to not just like think for myself. Um, and of course the drugs were impairing my ability to think as well. Um, but more importantly, to trust in myself. And so I think we, for those of us who are waking up to being on meds for years, trying to extricate ourselves and heal, it takes such, it takes such, um, deep, deep strength to, to, forge ahead when you haven't had the experience of trusting in yourself and standing firm in what you believe in and, and like, you know, tracking down information because you want to get informed. Like we get so used, we get taught to be passive recipients of information from our doctors. We get taught to not think that what our minds are telling us should be trusted. It's big. It's really big. And it makes it especially hard, I think, to navigate these, these all these questions. Um, but holy cow, once you start to connect with that, after not having had it, then you're off to the races. And like, I'm, I'm looking at Ange right now. She's like, oh yeah, <laughs> um, you're, all, you're good to go. It's just a matter of that, that period where you don't yet know how to trust in yourself that, that it's especially hard, I think. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Laura. We know now you need to go. So we appreciate your time. Uh, and um, thank you. Laura. Thank thank you. you everyone. Um, Thanks so much for organizing this. It's so, it's so important. Yeah. And thank you so much to pan my fellow panelists, to the, to the audience and to Lynn and Wendy for making a film and Angie for being in it. And take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. We will make this the uh, um, the last question. I, I know that there are so many questions in the chat box, and we'll somehow try to collect all of these and perhaps answer those in the form of an email later on. But we really appreciate you asking us so many uh, questions. Um, I just want to put two, you know, few questions together. And the theme is that okay, now we know the problem. Uh, rather than focusing on the problem and saying how you know, how, how yeah, exactly, how bad it is, what the, you know, how horrible the situation is, how can we rise above that? You know, where do we go from here? Um, and there was one question here um, saying, I'm a trained coach. However, my goal is to become a, uh, become a coach that helps people transition off their medications. And I know how important this is because a lot of people out there are going to Facebook groups because they haven't got any help, for example, from, uh, from the doctors. So the question is, do you have any advice for um, how to tra transition to help people, coach people, come off medications uh, safely and perhaps even certifications or trainings? Um, and I just wanted to check if anyone had any any comments to make about that. Well, Lynn, do you want to say something about the, um, you know, audiences that we show the film to, they're always asking for solutions. Mm -hmm. Unmute yourself, though. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guess part of oh. why we have put this summit together is because we are not only going to look at the problems, but we are also going to look at the solutions, aren't we? Is there something you wanted to say, Suresh? No, Lynn's going to say something. Of course, oh, Lynn. It, it, I, I don't. I think that's a great idea. Whoever asked that question to be, to look into how to become a coach. We need so many more coaches because one of the things is people say, "Well, now what? We're all talking about this. We realize it's a problem, and I don't think it's an, a problem that a doctor can solve. A person can. I mean, it, it is a society-wide problem. So the more we learn, the more books we read, the more we listen to each other, uh, the better. Um, and even the notion of what is the solution is, there's not one prescribed solution for anybody. So, um, you know, as Angie says, equine therapy can work for one person, cognitive behavioral therapy can work for another, a drug can actually work for another. And it doesn't, it just needs to be talked about and ideas and solutions need to be shared. And I, I, I also think, and I don't know how to do this, but I know there are 
I know there are great, there is a great researcher at University of Pennsylvania who's doing his best to come up with some solutions and look at the studies. But I think we need more very serious studies about withdrawal and about how to get people off the meds. And until those studies are out there with real data behind them, I think we're just gonna have to just support each other um, and learn from each other and listen. But great question and do become a coach. I think it's a great idea. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. And also to say that Suraj and I are definitely looking in this direction as to how can we build a community full of coaches and therapists and healthcare professionals who want to help people come off medication safely. So um, just please uh, stay in the conversation. This is where we're going to wrap up the discussion. But first, I want to make sure that each panelist um, can say um, a few closing thoughts and we'll keep it brief, but also like if they want to say anything more about their work, and this, this is a chance. So let's go to um, Sandy, first of all. Mm. Yeah, I don't have um, too much more to, to add. I, you know, I appreciate what everyone is, um, is doing here and uh, so I uh, thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Sandy. Brian. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, so I, I guess I hope people are inspired and moved by, by the film and by the discussion. Um, I have a YouTube series um, called Vital Conversations in Mental Health, and it's basically about broadening understandings in mental health helping people see that there are um, ways of recovering outside of the medical model and also broadening the perspectives from within the mental mo uh, medical model um, and yeah and I also think I, I'm I, I uh, at one stage I fit the bill for a diagnosis I would have fit the bill for binge eating disorder I benefited from a mind-body approach called Alexander Technique which I currently teach but I also think that mind-body approaches will not be suggested to you by your doctor things like acupuncture equine therapy but they are extremely powerful and if you can find a mind-body approach that is helpful for you then that could be something that's really powerful too thank you thank you brian lynn uh, when we first when we had a rough cut of this very film we invited uh, you know a, a room full of very famous psychiatrists i won't name anybody and psychologists in the new york city area and of course they did not like the film, my heart was beating. Um, but my question was, well, why? Why didn't you guys like it? And there was a long pause and they said, well, you could have made 20 films about this topic. It's way too superficial, which I thought was such an interesting and valid response to the film. It's a very broad film. We need more films out there. Anybody can share a story. It doesn't have to be a film like this. It can be on YouTube. And because the more we get out there, the more we will be talking about this. And um, while I hope that that group of doctors someday begins to listen to the issues in this film, I think they're right. There could be so many films made um, on this topic. Even Medicating Normal could be made 20 different ways from a different perspective. So um, here's to making more films. Thank you. Finally, over to you, Angie. Hi, I think um, my closing thoughts will just be that I think we always looking for something outside of ourselves to fix us or to tell us everything is going to be okay. Or, you know, just like this, like kind of what Laura was saying earlier, like this being passive and not really being involved with your own life. And, and, and also often I hear people saying like, you know, I need a mental health day or I need to take care of my mental health or my mental health is being affected. And I always think like, that's your life. It's not just your mental health, it's your life. So I would just really strongly suggest everybody, including myself, I'm talking to myself right now too, <laughs> that we just like take our, take, take our lives back in our hands, that we do have the power and the knowledge and the wisdom to listen inside, to know what we need, to maybe like find out what's really causing the problems. I remember at the beginning of this journey, I asked myself like, why am I depressed? Just that one simple question, why? And I kept like, I would answer it and I would say, okay, but why? Okay, okay, but why? And then it, like, when I got down to the bottom of it, it was like, because your psychiatrist told you that. And it's like, that's not a reason why I'm depressed. Like, because somebody told me I was. 
So just, I don't know. It's the best thing I could say is just, you know, seek those answers for yourself. Let this be the beginning of a journey. Don't believe anything we say. I always love to say that. Don't believe the movie. Go read it yourself. Go figure out what's true for you. Thank you, Angie. And would you like to um, uh, finish off by sharing um, a bit about the movie and what are you trying to do with the with uh, medicating normal? Trying to spread the good word around the world. Lynn, you want to say or you yeah, well, I'll say, uh, I'll say the part about the, the website and everything real quick, and then you can finish okay. it off. Just we have tons of resources, a reading list, uh, research listed, all kinds of stuff on the on the face. On the, I'm sorry, on the website, medicatingnormal.com. And then every week or two, we do interviews with guests. Sandy, you're on the list. We'll get to you soon, I promise. But we interview really cool experts and people with lived experience to keep this conversation going. Our YouTube channel is a wealth of information and clips that didn't make it in the film. And we're on all social media platforms. So follow us, like us, leave us a review, tell your friends, share our website. That's what it's there for. And we just want to continue the conversation. And it, it, it would, the film will be aired in, in the States on public television, but not at the same time, which is going to make, we're, we're today just talking to people that might help us roll this out. Um, it will be uh, aired in different cities and regions at um, different days and times. So we will do our very best to, to announce these times on our website, but do stay posted to your public television. Um, if you're from the US, your public television schedule. And um, we also want it to get it up onto the platforms and that's complicated. And it's called TVOD, Transactional Video on Demand and SVOD. And all of that we would like to be a part of um, as well as having it available on our website. So stay tuned for all of that, but we will keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today. We appreciate your support and interest in the film and interest in the summit. And we hope to see you all um, come next Monday. So when we actually kick off with the rest of the summit. So it runs from Monday through till Wednesday. So and thank you thank both you for organizing it. Yes, thank you so for much. Us. It's a privilege. Thank, thank you, Sandy and Brian. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's a privilege you. to be here. Thank you.